theological audience and the scientific audience, two questions loom large. What can we ex accept today as scientific? And what can we accept today as religious? We're moving in a difficult uh, field. My, my uh, illustrations are completely determined by the kind of non-religious agnostic audience that I frequently have to speak to. I mean, I, I have to speak to them because they kindly invite me. So I go and, and express, you know, they're, they're rather puzzled sometimes that uh, people have our commitments because the, the environment is <coughs> simply different. Now for the community of believers, the challenge lies not so much in the first question as in the second. What can we accept today as religious? I mean, this is a question that is raised very frequently. Well, look, uh, the world has changed since the scientific revolution, and there are certain things that uh, we find in your book, uh, religions based on authority and dogma, to which I object. I say, no, I mean, it's basically uh, based on a personal acquaintance with God, a personal belief with God. It, it, we're not, I mean, as believers, we're not philosophers. I mean, we uh, are committed to the vision that we find in the Bible and to a living entity. So the problem of morality is often raised. I will give you uh, two texts that I have been more than once confronted with. I, I don't know if they find this this text on the web and <laughs> people who who hurl it at me. Uh, it's it's a, a provocative way of of, uh, of saying that. But, but you know, in your book you have a God who is, you say, um, it's very good, but there are really instances where God is not good. Uh, so the answer to this, I think, should be, I, I submit to you, is that we reject what is not moral and we reject what is not historical. At the level of morality, we Catholics today, I mean, I hope, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, but I hope there will not be too much dissent here. <laughs> we reject the notion of a murderous God that seems to be condoned in the Bible. And we reject the denial of freedom of conscience that we have to admit, unfortunately, the Vatican I distinguish between the Vatican and the Catholic Church. The Vatican held until recently. May I have the first slide, please? Uh, the, uh, the next one. I thought this. Uh, th this text uh, is. Uh, I'm going to give you two of these uh, Old Testament texts that uh, are meant uh, uh, to embarrass me. <laughs> I suppose that's why they're hurled at it. Uh, we have two uh, two prophets, Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal, don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered them there. Now that's 450. So... Uh, Let's take the second quotation that is um, usually follows from the first. That's why it makes me suspect that it must be in the same site on the internet. <laughs> then Elisha, who uh, comes a bit later, went up from there to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some small boys came out of the town and mocked him. Go on up, you bald head, they said. Go on up, you bald head. <laughs> I failed challenge here. <laughs> he turned around, looked at them, and cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two female bears came out of the woods and tore up 42 of the boys. Now, I mean, I think there's only one answer. We don't believe uh, in this kind of God. And we believe that there has been uh, a, a certain evolution, and therefore it would be unfair uh, for uh, me to say to a scientist, oh, you believe in four elements like Aristotle. That was the scientific position. Now we have many more elements. And
and it would be unreasonable of me to believe that science has not evolved. And I think in this instance it would be unre unreasonable to believe uh, that there has not been an evolution and that uh, modern Catholic consciousness, I mean, uh, would not contemplate uh, this, this kind of approach. Now, my second uh, instance, and we can stay there, is uh, freedom of conscience. I, I mention this because the Pope recently has been insisting on this. Uh, for instance, when he says a few words uh, on, in the Vatican, he's been uh, reaffirming freedom of conscience. But if you read the encyclical Mirari Vos, the only reason I read Mirari Vos, which was published in 1832 or something by Pope Gregory XVI, was because it was thrust in my hand by uh, an agnostic at a meeting. <laughs> and he says, do you know what's written in this? I said, no, you read it, you see. And it's a, it's a dreadful document. I mean, it's really absolutely appalling. Don't read Mirari Vos. I mean, uh, uh, the Pope I mean, I'm quoting here, uh, condemns, among other things, among democracy and so on, that absurd and erroneous proposition which claims that liberty of conscience must be maintained for everyone. So here again, uh, I think the only answer is that we have evolved. Uh, and in this sense, one could say that the modern developments of society, innovation in the way we deal with each other, the fact that now we have a democracy. Our democracies can go bankrupt, but at least we can vote for the people who have put us into trouble. Uh, so these, this is one side of the question. We do not believe in what is not moral. Therefore, we have to exercise, and we believe in freedom of conscience. If we move now to the historical plane, uh, there, the, the, the line of criticism uh, concerns, of course, evolution. I mean, we are in a better position than uh, our Protestant uh, brothers. Uh, thanks to Galileo, the, the church did learn something. At the First Vatican Council in 1870, some Italian bishops uh, decided it was high time to condemn Darwin. And so they had a proposal prepared and an American bishop who had a very, very hard time speaking Latin, which was the language used at the Vatican, wrote two words on a piece of paper and asked to stand up. He stood up and he read his text, which reads, Mementote Galileo. The motion to condemn Darwin disappeared. As you know, in the Vatican, nothing is ever retracted. Documents just disappear. So there was no, we have never condemned. I mean, I think we can say this with some, I'm proud of saying it. Church has never condemned at this time. So, but nonetheless, the issue becomes, well, then there are a series of things that are traditionally linked to our beliefs. And uh, there are a number of things that are no's. Shall I have the next slide, please? Uh, and they, if you if you catalog them in this uh, somewhat provocative way, there are no six-day creation, no Adam and the rib. Women are usually happy with that. <laughs> no Eve and the apple. No fall of man. No Noah and the ark. No Tower of Babel. No Joshua and the sun. No three children in a fiery furnace. Well, I usually say that I agree with all these no's and, and that we hire people in our faculties of theologies who are called exegetes and we set them to sort of interpret uh, what is the religious significance of these stories. I mean, these stories have a real content. Um, what is called original sin, I mean, if you think that Augustine had it right, well, then that's your privilege. Uh, if you think that Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, not the Ran, Rana, Cardinal Rana, who wrote a, when I was a student, I remember reading 150 pages of rather ponderous German to be told that we all had to descend from one Adam. 
otherwise there would be no original sin until I managed to discover this is really very dangerous because what if one day it hasn't happened yet uh, we discover that life appeared in different parts in the world uh, you so theologians can learn from science in this sense never paint yourself into a corner never tie something that is important uh, original sin is the only dogma in a sense that is obvious isn't it <laughs> it's all around us it's I mean I I suffer from that problem <laughs> but we should not tie it to a particular account uh, in a sense one should look for the inspiration so the, the the basic point of view that Mariano emphasized was that the author of the book of nature and the author of the book of scripture is the same God and since he is a very <laughs> the greatest mind Galileo uh, uh, Mariano would say we would not expect him to contradict himself there can be no contradictions the uh, the contradictions come in our inability to understand the story so it seems to me that paradoxically paradoxically God did not go about either of these tasks creating the world or creating the Bible in as direct and immediate a way as we might have expected and as earlier generations took for granted take one instance uh, from our early childhood Mariano and I to today the Bible is full of stories that were written down by human beings who were as we used to say inspired and I <laughs> still believe that this is one way of speaking about scripture but what I find interesting is biblical scholars uh, constantly remind me of shifts in the interpretation for instance trivial ones like the second letter of Timothy which has this passage all scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching I like that as a teacher but uh, my uh, my colleagues tell me that you know if I think this second letter to Timothy was written by Paul I'm not a biblical scholar <laughs> <laughs> and, and so on so uh, one reaches the point that uh, it's difficult to know uh, who wrote these texts but I still think that they are meaningful however it's a question of reconstructing their genesis is conjectural and I think we have to let biblical scholars do their work I might even suggest them that we can pray for them and ask them to be inspired in their research. But uh, Cardinal Martini is very good at this. I mean, he was the head of the Biblical Commission. He would sometimes remind people that the Biblical Commission at the turn of the last century would uh, actually tell biblical scholars how to read the texts. I think nowadays we would rather have them read the text and then tell us, you know, what we should understand in that light. I want uh, to, uh, I mean this text will be published in some way so I'm not going to bore you with the whole thing but I want to give you another instance of the problems in science and religion along this line. Uh, I, I wanted to spend some time on what Galilei, uh, what Mariano uh, was fond of discussing is the, uh, the Big Bang. Well, the Big Bang is now in, in, in a various forms and various shapes the current theory that is being discussed and it does uh, make it possible to attract attention to uh, to God but when I was a student I mean now you think I'm going to be say that I'm really old um, I was a student in Cambridge in the 60s and there were three persons there, uh, one called Bondi, Gold, and they had a theory that was soon to run into trouble, but was the theory that was discussed. It was called the steady state theory. 
Now, my students have never heard of the steady state theory. I mean, why? Because it died a natural death when uh, Martin Ryle found out that the concentration of matter was such that the steady state theory that had been worked out by Bondi and Gold and uh, who's the third one? And Fred Hoyle. Uh, well, so we were talking about this and I, I, I think I mentioned to, to Fred Hoyle, I said, where does this come from? And he said, Bill, you haven't read our article that appeared in Nature in 1948. I hope that no one here has read this article because it would destroy my story. So he said, I'm going to send you a copy. It was a photocopy in those days. But things moved fast in Cambridge. So I got this there. And he's, he, how this paper starts is this way, by a story. First paragraph is a story. Then comes the steady state theory that became standard for some 10 or 15 years and is now completely forgotten. It starts like this. It's, it's a very English story. Uh, a man walks home one evening in London and it's dark and he sees a policeman close to a lamp post. The policeman is there and next to him is a man and he says, beg your pardon, what are you doing? Well, he says, I... I saw this gentleman is looking here for his keys that he lost and he can't get home. And so the man says, but are, are, are you sure that you lost your key here? And the man answers, no, I'm not sure that I lost my key here, but this is the only place where I have light. <laughs> okay. I'm not inventing this, you know. And then these three characters, the, the funny one is Herman Bundy, he was really the most, he was a delightful character. Uh, the idea is, look, I mean, if you have a steady state theory that Lemaitre and Gamow and other people worked out, it explains nothing. Because, you know, you wall, roll things up and roll things up and roll things up and then you arrive at a certain time when all the laws of physics break down. <laughs> and, you know, it's, you don't know. You call it a Big Bang, but that's just, uh, that's, uh, I, I think it's Fred Hoyle who, who called it Big Bang. It just was not there before him. So here is a theory. It's very interesting. A scientific community has a theory. They have PhDs for 10 years writing on this. I know a man called Cameron who worked out for the steady state theory that he needed to inject one atom of hydrogen every 10,000 years. And he got a PhD from this in Cambridge. And it's okay. So things have certainly changed. So what can we do, I think? Uh, well, be aware of the fact that there is a change in science. Also aware of the fact and, uh, that uh, we can, and I, I'll give an example in my paper, uh, probabilities, uh, we are dealing with probabilities. What uh, we can do in science is get scientists to become aware of the fact that there are problems in the science uh, where some mind, as Mariano put it, is required. And if I will end, I was suggested this uh, yesterday by my three colleagues who are here. So I'll give you two instances of things that I occasionally mention and uh, Mariano thought that at least one of them I told them was rather funny. How do you get people to investigate things? Because you know you have miracles and they say, oh well that's just a coincidence, no? The laws of probability make it that this kind of cure could have happened. It can't be a miracle. Well let me give you two instances where uh, the probabilities would be such that we would have to investigate. I have two examples and I will conclude on this if you'll give me another three minutes. My first one I will call near escape. Terrorists have captured you. You've all been captured by terrorists. And they decide to take one of us and execute him and it happens to be you. So, you find yourself facing a firing squad. There are 12 expert marksmen aim their rifles at you, and as you open one eye to get your last glimpse of the sun, 
you hear them pull their triggers on the command to execute you. You close your one open eye. The hammers and the rifles click against the backdrop of utter silence. You shudder and nothing happens. All twelve of the rifles have misfired. <laughs> Paralyzed from dread, you slump to the ground, wondering why you are still here. Thank God, you whisper as you pass out. <laughs> when you regain consciousness, you begin to ponder your strange fate. How could 12 new rifles operated by 12 expert marksmen all simultaneously misfire? You recall the feeble thank God that passed from your lips before you lost consciousness. But you're now beginning to wonder. Your present circumstance is the result of 12 remarkable coincidences. But you don't really believe in coincidences. And you can't quite bring yourself to believe that God himself put his finger on the hammers of all those rifles and made them misfire. So you lie awake in your cell, staring at the ceiling, asking yourself what really happened. My second example, I call the, well, the lottery ticket. It's even simpler. Suppose that the uh, vice rector of the University of Navarra, who honors us by her presence this morning, has a staff, staffs are always inflated these days, of nine members. Is that mic pretty close? <laughs> okay. That's a staff of nine members, and they all decide to buy one ticket apiece in the national Spanish lottery. All ten of them win prizes on the drawing, and no one else in Spain wins anything. Now, it is not at all remarkable that there were ten winners. The history of the lottery could reveal that ten winners is normal. But that these ten winners should all be members of the staff of the vice president of the University of Navarra is not normal. The odds, and there are odds, are vanishingly small that this could be the case. The situation seems so improbable that some sort of investigation would certainly be launched. <laughs> <laughs> now, you see, if we look, uh, I had a part of the paper which I look at the anthropic principles, or the fact that you and I are here. You, know, you start with atoms and you end up with uh, brilliant professors and teachers at the University of Nevada. Uh, we have won the lottery. As far as we know, Homo sapiens has won all the prizes. So we cannot dismiss the question, how can we account for this fact? It is clear that there is something to explain for scientists cannot help being curious about this remarkable constellation of coincidences. Thank you very much. Bien, pues finalizamos este acto en el que se enmarca la primera lección conmemorativa Mariano Artigas. Pienso que el propio acto lo ha dicho casi todo. Hemos recordado la figura humana y científica, verdaderamente universitaria, de don Mariano. Nos han hablado del CRIF. Hemos tenido la oportunidad de escuchar al doctor Xi, que nos ha planteado muchas cuestiones sobre la relación entre ciencia y fe. Y como sucede en todo acto universitario, celebración y reflexión van, van de la mano. La reflexión que me planteo y que les planteo en esta ocasión tiene que ver con la figura de don Mariano, con todo lo que hemos escuchado esta mañana aquí. Es un término que ya ha aparecido y que creo que es la otra protagonista de esta lección conmemorativa, que es la interdisciplinariedad, la dimensión interdisciplinar del trabajo universitario. 
el lugar que ocupa en nuestra vida académica, su importancia, su necesidad. Me he tomado la molestia de contar las sílabas de esta palabra interdisciplinariedad que los que comparten aquí el acto en la mesa esta mañana se habrán dado cuenta que es una palabra difícil de decir. Es una palabra difícil de decir. De decir tiene 13 sílabas y pienso que es una palabra tan difícil de decir como, como es una tarea difícil de realizar. Difícil pero imprescindible para que la universidad cumpla su misión porque pertenece a la esencia misma de la tarea universitaria. En el reciente encuentro del Escorial, que algunos tuvimos la, la fortuna de presenciar, Benedicto XVI nos decía, la universidad ha sido y está llamada a ser siempre la casa donde se busca la verdad propia de la persona humana. Y a esa verdad, a esa verdad sobre la persona humana, solo tenemos acceso limitado pero real a través de un, de un verdadero diálogo entre las ciencias. Un diálogo que además esté abierto a las cuestiones últimas, a las que hacen referencia al sentido, donde se enmarca también esa relación entre fe y razón. Por eso renunciar al, al diálogo interdisciplinar es renunciar a la tarea más importante y más necesaria en la universidad. Por otra parte, no podemos olvidar que más allá de la puesta en marcha de líneas o de proyectos o de centros con carácter interdisciplinar, algo realmente necesario, el verdadero reto, y ha salido también esto aquí, es que esta se haga realidad en nosotros, los profesores universitarios. Y esto de nuevo no es tarea fácil. Eh, los profesores nos vemos encerrados en áreas de conocimiento, no sé si decir como leones enjaulados, no estoy muy segura de que sea la metáfora adecuada, ¿verdad? Pero pues limitados en unas áreas en las que nacemos, crecemos y morimos académicamente hablando. Y nos familiarizamos con el lenguaje propio de esa área, dominamos sus métodos, exploramos sus límites, hacemos avanzar un poquito el conocimiento, nos enfrentamos a sus problemas. Y hay tanto que, que estudiar y que investigar. Es casi lógico concebir la actividad interdisciplinar como una meta inalcanzable o una tarea propia para académicos de otros tiempos o para personas excepcionales. Pero la realidad es, es otra. Todo profesor universitario, sea del área que sea, está llamado, estamos llamados a ser maestros. Maestros como los definía Benedicto XVI. Personas abiertas a la verdad total en las diferentes ramas del saber sabiendo escuchar y viviendo en su propio interior ese diálogo interdisciplinar. Personas convencidas sobre todo de la capacidad humana de avanzar en el camino hacia la verdad. Un camino que compromete también al ser humano por entero. Un camino de la inteligencia y del amor, de la razón y de la fe. Yo no tuve la, la suerte de conocer a don Mariano. Me acuerdo mucho de él cuando voy mal de tiempo y leo artículos por la calle, que a veces lo hago, porque me dijeron que es algo que hacía él. Mi, mi imitación de Mariano me temo que se limita, se limita a esto, a veces a leer por la calle. Pero estoy segura, estoy segurísima que se le podría definir con justicia como un verdadero maestro. Y su figura es para todos nosotros un referente y un ejemplo. No todos podremos seguir sus mismos pasos, pero en todos nosotros se puede hacer realidad, en mayor o menor medida, ese diálogo interior del que nos habla Benedicto XVI. Esa sensibilidad, esa ilusión por la verdad que se manifiesta luego en expresiones tan asequibles y necesarias como leer, reflexionar, dialogar. Pienso que el, el profesor Xi nos ha dado un buen ejemplo de cómo lleva a cabo esto don Mariano y eso es un, un ejemplo cercano para nosotros y asequible. Así que el reto de la interdisciplinariedad es, en definitiva, una invitación a que la universidad como institución y nosotros como personas que formamos parte de ella, descubramos las raíces más profundas, más auténticas de nuestra vocación profesional. Y lo que constituye, además, la contribución más valiosa, tal vez poco reconocida, que podemos hacer a nuestros estudiantes primero y a la sociedad después. Muchas gracias. Clausurada la lección conmemorativa Mariano Artigas.